Well, good morning, everybody. Welcome to Colonial Church. So glad you're with us online. So glad so many of you are here with us this morning. If you're here, would you stand with me? If you're online, we're glad you're using whatever platform works, whether it's colonialchurch.com slash live or Facebook or YouTube. I would love for you. In fact, if you're here, um, we're not going to do the normal greeting time where we go around and hug each other and you know, maybe spread some kind of virus or something. But would you look around the room? Would you air high five? Make eye contact with somebody and air high five somebody. If you're online, jump into the Facebook comment section or onto our live site in the chat room and just say hi. Say, say you're glad to be here. Tell us where you're watching from or what you're doing right now. We'd love to just connect in some way. We're going to worship this morning, and I was thinking about the importance of coming together. Some people come to church every once in a while. I am, I'm saying this not just as a pastor who literally gets paid to be here. That's a weird thought, right? But I value us coming together on a Sunday morning, whether it's online or it's here physically so much because I don't know about you, but I forget what's true. I just, I hear somebody preach. <laughs> I don't care how good it is. And I'm at lunch on a Sunday and I forgot what they said. I, I hear something profound. I read something on my own. I'm, I, I learn something about who God is, about what life's about. And I forget over and over again. And so, so much of the time when we come back together, we sing a song and I have that, oh yeah, moment. That's what's true. Or we hear something read from the scripture and I have that, Oh yeah, moment, that's what's true. And I hope that's what happens for you today. I hope that's what happens for me today. Uh, we're gonna sing a few songs on purpose. The lyrics matter, they've been chosen to bring us back to what's true. Uh, one of the images in this first song is water. God uses imagery for us. I, I think of uh, the writer to the Hebrews in Hebrews 10 where he says our sins are washed away. The power of that image because of Jesus. I think of the psalmist, Psalm 23, where he says, we are led by him beside still waters, peaceful streams, and the peace that brings. I think of Jesus talking to the woman at the well, and she said, he, he said to her, I, I came to give you life, life-giving water, living water. There's something powerful about this imagery, and I hope that you are washed over by the imagery this morning as we sing together, as we open up the scriptures together and we remember what we have forgotten. You guys ready? Wherever you are, here with us as well, let's, let's worship together.
Can you speak and grant me dignity? You invite me to your table. You offer me a drink. Your kindness kills the fear of me. So I say.
continue to pray. Father, we do say yes to you. Thank you for the invitation. Thank you for the constant open invitation to trust you, to follow you, to give back to you, to surrender again today to you, Lord. Thank you. I pray the posture of our hearts is pleasing to you in this moment. you are, right where you are. Let's lift up a hand. Father, um, when I think of a handful of things that I'm thankful for, Lord, we come to you and choose gratitude in this moment. You are so generous to us. I think of a handful of things I'm grateful for. Father, I'm so grateful for Colonial. I'm so grateful for church family. I'm so grateful for the way you are gracious with us, forgetful people. Art for justice in this world. I'm thankful to remember that you grieve more than any of us as we see the calamity around us. Father, I'm thankful for little things. I'm thankful today for at the movies, t shirts, and fun things that we get to do together, Father. Lord, hear our prayers right now as we just silently lift up to you the things we're grateful for, Father. Father, as, as we close our fists, Lord, we, we confess, I confess the way I tighten my grip on my stuff, the way I tighten my grip, even emotionally and, and mentally, just fearfully, and anxiety takes a grip of me at times. Father, I confess that to you. I acknowledge that your perfect love casts out all fear, that you own the cattle on a thousand hills, that you are sovereign that you win in the end. Father, thank you for the way you loosen my grip. Thank you for the way you call me to trust, and to surrender again. And Father, we just, we just extend our open hands to you and beg you to have your way with us, have your way with your people. Here at Colonial, here across our city, have your way with us. Act through us, change our hearts, change our minds change our character, take a hold of all of our resources, our time, our money. It's all yours. We acknowledge it was never ours in the first place. We give it back to you. We recommit to you, Father. Thank you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You guys can have a seat. Thank you guys for leading us this morning. Shelby, I like how you're just patting that little baby while you're singing to us. That is one of my favorite moments of the day. <laughs> um, hey, we're so glad you're here today. I am very excited about two things that are coming back to Colonial that we haven't had in a while. Are you ready? Two things, I, you're gonna be excited. First of all, I think it was eight or nine years ago, we had this thing here at Colonial Church that is in other churches already in our city, that's in other churches all over the country and actually all over the world, we had this thing called Celebrate Recovery. And it is a vibrant, Christ-centered, 12-step ministry that is all about meeting us exactly where we are, just as we are, not the way we're supposed to be or the way we try to put our masks on here at church or really in life in general in our culture and act like everything's fine, but right where we are in our mess, in our addictions, in our bad habits, in our wrong ways of thinking, in our woundedness, maybe from some stuff we experienced growing up, uh, in our stresses, all kinds of things. It's not just for drug and alcohol addiction, by the way. Let me be clear about that, even though a lot of folks come to, to CR, Celebrate Recovery, because of it. But we have had a growing interest in bringing this recovery ministry back to Colonial. And so I want to make sure this is right in front of you. It's on our app. It's on our webpage. But we have an interest meeting. You're committing to nothing. You're just coming to find out more. We have an interest meeting for Celebrate Recovery one week from this Tuesday. So it's July 7th at 7 p.m. We're going to have a Zoom chat. So no matter where you are, you can jump on with us and talk with a few other folks that are interested. So that's 7-7 seven, seven at 7. We didn't plan that, but that's going to stick in your head, right? 7-7 seven, seven at 7. July 7th at 7 p.m. If you click on our app, it'll have a Zoom link. You can just use that link for next week. Um, every church I've been a part of, I'm 50 years old, and I have been active in a church everywhere I've lived. Every church that I love, that I just cherish the ministry of those churches, they have had CR. They have had a recovery ministry. 
And, and so I want you to know I could not be more excited about the way this is going to change lives. Come check it out with us a week from Tuesday. Second thing that's coming back, uh, it started, ironically, about eight or nine years ago, the same time frame we lost CR, unrelated, totally unrelated. But we started this eight or nine years ago. So many of you have been coming to church because of at the movies. I just got to talk to Morris and Stacy. Morris came two years ago for the first time to our church because Stacy invited them to at the movies. This is part of our story here at Colonial. Check this video out. will never do that again. I love it. That, that would be me trying to, to rap or anything else. That's, that's right on. I cannot wait. It's next weekend. Did you guys know that? It's next weekend. It feels different because in years past, we have had this huge buildup to At The Movies. So many folks have been very active on campus to reshape our campus. We deck it all out. So many of you know the story of At The Movies. We're still doing it. In fact, I think it's God's perfect timing that when so many of us are at home on the couch watching TV and trying to engage with our church locally through the interwebs, that we get to do it for the first time online. So I just want to encourage you, next weekend and in the following weekends in July, do what you're comfortable with. I mean, don't apologize for enjoying it on your sofa in front of your big giant TV screen. Don't apologize for coming here and making the most of our auditorium and our sweet sound system. We're going to have concessions here. It's going to be amazing. Uh, a few quick details that start next weekend that affect all of us. We have two service times, two service times. We have no idea how many folks are going to come. We know as much as you do, but we want to be ready for as many people who want to come to be in this auditorium. We want to have space for everyone. And so next weekend, 930, which is our old early service time, so that'll be a little easier for some of us, but here's the catch. The second service is going to start at 1115. That gives us a little more time to disinfect and, and kind of have the transition of folks between services. It also allows us a little more time for our storytelling on the big screen. So 930 and 1115 starting next weekend, uh, we're going to be online as well as right here. A couple other details. Um, if you would like to get a yard sign, they're free yard signs. We've got some, some here this morning in the lobby. Unapologetically, take one on your way out, stick it in your yard. It's another way we can let our neighbors and friends know that it's coming throughout the month of July. Uh, we've also got yard signs as long as we've got some left that are going to be available outside the church office throughout the week. So you can come by anytime if you're online watching. Come by and just grab a yard sign, stick it in your yard. You can even stick it in your neighbor's yard and let him figure out why later. Um, or if you want a t-shirt, you probably shouldn't do that. Don't, don't do that. Um, you, uh, you can get a t-shirt if you go to the app. You can go to the app and order a t-shirt. Normally, we've sold t-shirts here, but we're going to make them available, whether you're here or you're online, to order through the app, and they can be shipped here to the church, or you can pay a little bit extra. It'll be shipped to your front door. Um, make sure you do that as well. Last thing I want to say about At The Movies is we've tried to do a good job of communicating this. We're going we're gonna to communicate a little bit more throughout the week this week. But if you're watching on Facebook or YouTube right now, you need to shift gears because as of next Sunday, the only way you can experience Colonial Church on a Sunday morning, at least for the month of July for At The Movies, is through our live website, colonialchurch.com slash live. 
Uh, if you go there, everything's going to be there. Next week, if you're in Facebook, if you're on YouTube, it, you're going to wonder where we went. You're going to think the church died or something, okay? But that's just what we're trying to, to live with as far as Facebook or YouTube, not really being cool about us showing even a, a good chunk of a movie online. They'll kick us off and we won't be able to get back on for a while. So if you could help spread the word, colonialchurch.com slash live. If you haven't figured out yet how to stream it to your TV, this would be the week to figure that out. Don't wait till Sunday at 9.55 and start texting me because I will not be able to help you. I probably wouldn't be able to help you Tuesday either, but find somebody who can help you stream that to your television. Okay. That's a lot. I'm excited. Anybody else excited about At The Movies? I cannot wait. There are stories of people coming to know Jesus because of At The Movies. There are stories of people coming to our church for the first time and finding family because of At The Movies. I, I could not be more excited about what's starting next weekend. Somebody else we haven't seen in a while, haven't heard from in a while, is one of our pastors, uh, Jordan White. Some of you don't know him. A lot of you do. Our spiritual formation pastor, he's going to be preaching today. Would you give a big welcome, even from your couch, for Jordan White? Well, good morning. It's so good to be with you, and it feels good to climb back up in the saddle again. You know, I, I Googled that just to see what that would present or pop up. Get back in the saddle means resuming something after an absence. Despite the presence of saddle, this phrase is rarely used in reference to riding horses. Uh, for example, I needed to take a break for a bit, but now I'm back in the saddle. December 15th, 2019 was the last time that I stepped on this stage and delivered a message that I was in the saddle, so to speak. And you know, I, I went back through that message that I preached on the 15th of December, The Reluctant Reconciler. I, I read it in detail, and I, I honestly, I honestly don't know what upset Pastor Lauren so bad that he has not allowed me to preach since, since then. In all seriousness, I hope you know that I'm joking. Uh, there are some of you that know that I went through a pretty tough time after preaching that sermon back in December. Around Christmas, I started to experience a mental and physical shutdown, which lasted on into the middle of March. And if you did not get a chance to check that out, to watch the Wednesday at Home that Pastor Lauren and I did, uh, where we talk through that, what I went through, some of the things that I experienced. I'd love for you to go back and watch the Wednesday at Home session that we did. It's going to be pushed out through the Colonial app today at the end of the service with our discussion questions. So I want to encourage you, if you have not already, download the Colonial app, turn on your notifications, and you'll be able to get that link directly along with some discussion questions that tie into today's message. Before I move on, I want to I want to share this. I want to say thanks to our elders and staff. I want you as our colonial family to know how supportive these folks were. Our, our family has never felt so loved, supported, and encouraged as we did uh, through this experience from our elders and staff. And over and over again, they would share with me, hey, whatever you need. Whatever you need, we're here for you, and we're here for your family. And it was such an encouragement to us. You see, I, I, didn't, I didn't always know what I needed through this. I mean, th this was unchartered territory for me. Um, but to know that our elders and our staff had my back, man, this was such a huge comfort to us. You know, you add to that my amazing wife, Shelly, my family, friends, and our God who never truly leaves you or forsakes you, um, I want you to know, I hope you hear me on this, there is hope when you encounter anxiety, depression, and despair. There is hope. I hope you hear that from me today. Now, let's shift gears and recap from our previous first two weeks where Pastor Lauren uh, started this series off for us. He shared with us the first week, he showed us how we can change our thinking. He said, we say yes to Jesus honoring ideas, images, and information. And we say no to Jesus grieving ideas, 
images, and information. Then he addressed in the second week how we can change our feelings. We must choose to receive and extend hope, faith, love, joy, and peace. Today we're turning our attention toward changing our will and our character. Changing our will and our character. You know, I, I guess I should know a little bit about spiritual formation, right? I, I mean, I, I think I'm the spiritual formation pastor here at Colonial. It'd be kind of bad if I didn't know a, just a little bit about spiritual formation. I love this explanation of spiritual formation from Christian author and philosopher Dallas Willard's website. It says, spiritual formation is the process through which those who love and trust Jesus Christ effectively take on his character. When this process is what it should be, they increasingly live their lives as he would if he were in their place. Their outward conformity to his example and his instructions rises toward fullness as their inward sources of action take on the same character as his. They come more and more to share in his vision, love, hope, feelings, and habits. In the language of his great commission to his disciples, they are taught to obey everything I have commanded you. I want you to consider some questions today. How do we come to love and trust Jesus? Where does the Bible speak about us becoming more like him? What is the process of change that we go through? You see, in my own personal journey of walking with Jesus since trusting him at age seven, there are four things I have discovered in the scriptures that are my essential, so to speak, regarding who God is and what he has done through biblical history and in my life and what he desires from us. And when challenges come against these things, I have a firm foundation to stand on because they're based on the teachings of Scripture. These are four areas that I will not compromise and I believe will help us to answer these questions that I presented to you. First, Jesus Christ is the only way to be delivered from sin and its consequences. We read in John 14, 6, Jesus told him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one can come to the Father except through me. Acts 4.12 says there is salvation in no one else. God has given no other name under heaven by which we must be saved. In 1 Timothy 2.5, there is one God and one mediator who can reconcile God and humanity, the man Christ Jesus. And if you'll hold there on 1 Timothy 2.5, we're going to come back to verses 5 and 6 later in the message. You see, only through Jesus can we be restored back into a right relationship with God. He initiates the process and He provides the way for us to be restored. Second, once I respond to the invitation of Jesus, then I am being changed into His image, transformed into His likeness. We see this in 2 Corinthians 3.18, where Paul tells us, And we all, with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. Galatians 2.20, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself up for me. Romans 12, 2, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. That is a key phrase there in the Greek, be transformed. The same verb is rendered transfigured. In the transfiguration narratives of Matthew 17 and Mark 9, the only other place that it occurs in the New Testament is 2 Corinthians 3.18, which we just read a few moments ago. Of believers being changed into the likeness of Christ from one degree of glory to another by the operation of the Lord, who is the Spirit. 
You see, upon having a real encounter with Jesus, the Bible says that I am born again. I am a new creation. I have a new identity. And that new identity now impacts my behavior and affects the choices and decisions that I make on a regular basis. We are to have His attitude, as Paul tells us in Philippians 2.5. We are to be like-minded with Jesus Christ. Third, as disciples, we are taught to obey everything Jesus has commanded. And most importantly, we are to love God and to love His people. We see that in Matthew chapter 22. In Matthew 22, 37 through 40, Jesus tells us that the greatest commandments are to have love for God and love for others. Love for God and love for others who are made in God's image. Now, this is very important. Don't miss that. We're going to come back to that and stress that here in a moment as well. Fourth, sharing my faith and making disciples is non-negotiable. Sharing my faith and making disciples is non-negotiable. We see that in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, in Matthew 28, 18 through 20. We are to be His witnesses. We are to invest in others and make disciples. This is what God is calling us to. This is what we are supposed to be doing as believers in Christ. We're so, supposed to be His ambassadors, His witnesses, getting the word out, advancing the kingdom, making disciples, helping people to grow and understand what it means to be transformed into the image of Christ. Another article from Dallas Willard's website says this, Spiritual formation in the tradition of Jesus Christ is the process of transformation of the inmost dimension of the human being, the heart, which is the same as the spirit or will. It is being formed, really transformed in such a way that its natural expression comes to be the deeds of Christ done in the power of Christ. Spiritual formation could and should be the process by which those who are Jesus' apprentices or disciples, those two words can be used interchangeably, come easily to do all things whatsoever I have commanded you. What I call the author, what he calls the great omission from the great commission is the fact that Christians generally don't have a plan for teaching others to do everything that he commanded. We don't even as a rule have a plan for how this plays out in our own lives, for us learning it ourselves and perhaps assume it is simply impossible to do what Jesus is calling us to do. And that explains the yawning abyss today between being a Christian and being a disciple. There is a difference. We have a form of religion that has accepted non-obedience to Christ, the author says. And the hunger for spirituality and spiritual formation in our day is a direct consequence of that. This is crucial for us to understand. It's crucial for us to understand. When we talk about this all-important concept of spiritual formation, we are focusing our attention on the progression of life in which Christ followers actually do all the things that Jesus taught us to do. This is focused on the heart. Our aim in spiritual formation is for a change of the inner person where our actions come from. When Jesus says we are to teach them everything I have commanded you, then to make disciples is not complete until it leads to a life of observing and implementing Jesus' commandments. Hello? Maybe I'm up here preaching to myself. I'm I'm sure the online crowd, I'm I'm sure y'all are jumping up and down on the couch right now. All right? Let me say that to you again. When Jesus says we are to teach them to obey everything I have commanded you, then to make disciples is not complete unless it leads to a life of observing and implementing Jesus' commandments. There you go. Touchdown. Field goal. Win the game. That's it right there, Christians. I believe pastor and author John Piper does an excellent job of summarizing this part of spiritual formation. You see, we must intentionally and at the same time with God's grace by the inner working of the Holy Spirit beg Him to first 
incline my heart means to bend my heart toward the things of God. The psalmist says, incline my heart to your testimonies and not to selfish gain. Open my eyes. We are to cry out. Open my eyes that I may behold wondrous things out of your law. Unite my heart. Beg him to focus us. Teach me your way, O Lord, that I may walk in your truth. Unite my heart to fear your name. Satisfy me. Satisfy me with nothing else but with Jesus and the relationship that I have in him. That I have a hunger and a thirst for him. Satisfy us in the morning with your steadfast love. That we may rejoice and be glad all of our days. Satisfy me. So what is a current reality of being restored back to God through Jesus? Being transformed into the image of Christ. Loving God and loving people. And finally, sharing our faith and making disciples. Anybody want to take a guess? Anybody want to take a stab at it? Come on, come on, folks. It's a change in our character. It's a change in our will. It's the title of the message today. When in doubt, throw out the title of the message. It may be the correct answer. I realize that racial tension has escalated in our country. And there are many issues and differences of opinions on our heart and mind. But we have to go back to character. We have to think in terms of character. And I want to encourage you today in light of character. Character is huge. You see, it is right for us to shift away from judging people by the color of their skin to judging them by the content of their character. It's right to do that. And let me be clear. I'm not trying to minimize the tension. Look, please, please understand me. I am not trying to downplay the tension that we have. But what I am saying is this. I believe we have more of a heart, will, character problem than anything else. We have a heart, will, character problem than anything else. Which means we actually have a spiritual formation problem, job security, because if the result of spiritual formation is the setting aside of our will and becoming more like Jesus, then character is the real issue. Character is the real issue. As I heard one pastor say, don't try to change the nation if God can't even change your heart. Don't try to change the nation if God can't even change your heart. You see, we have to develop a heart that cares for our fellow man because they are created in the image of, of God, not because they look like us. We have to care for our fellow man, not because they look like us, but because they're created in the image of God. You see, racial reconciliation has already happened in the person and work of Jesus. And if you think I'm making this up, go back to Romans chapter 10 and 2 Corinthians 5. You'll see that through the blood of Jesus Christ, we are able to be reconciled back to God, both Jew and Greek. The human race has a savior. The human race as a savior. Woohoo! What people need is not racial reconciliation in the way most people are talking about it today. What our world needs is the gospel. The world needs the gospel. Jesus is sufficient. His work on the cross is sufficient. He cried out to Telestai. It is finished. Nothing else needs to be done. You see, reconciliation is at the heart of the gospel. Christians just need to believe it. We just need to believe it and put it into practice on a daily basis. And this is done by surrendering our will, putting it down, and picking up the will of Jesus. You see, our character can then be changed into his character. And flowing from that, our decisions, our choices, our interactions with people will be different because our hearts have been transformed. Delight yourself in the Lord, 
And he will give you the desires of your heart, as, as the psalmist says. When we sit with him, when we spend time with him, we're being transformed into his image. And we will treat and interact with people differently. You see, that is spiritual formation. And this is God's primary focus in the life of the believer. This is what God is doing. Listen to what Charles Swindoll says in his book, The Mystery of God's Will. It's a great read if you've never read it. So much of the confusion we encounter in life goes back to our not understanding of God and how he does his inscrutable work in our lives. In recent years, Swindoll says, I have struggled with many of what I am calling mysteries in my own life. As a result, I have come to a new understanding of God's will. In the past, I often viewed the Christian life, or just life in general, as a matter of getting from here to there, going from point A to point B. I now believe, he says, that God's will for us in this life is not some black and white objective equation designed to take us to an appointed destination here on earth as much as it is, as it is about the journey itself. It is not so much about our own well-thought-through mission for our lives as it is about what matters to Him in our lives. Swindoll goes on to say, Our human tendency is to focus solely on our calling, on where we should go, on how we should get there, and how we should go about it. But God's concern, God's concern is the process that He is taking us through to mature us and ready us, making us more like His Son, Jesus. In other words, all of us, including you, are works in process. You see, God is more concerned about the process, seeing you change into the image and likeness of Jesus than anything else. But what does it mean to take on the character of Jesus? What does it mean to take on the character of Jesus? New Testament scholar Craig Bloomberg explains that the religiously respectable of Jesus' day refused to associate or eat with people considered sinners, such as tax collectors, prostitutes. And they did this for fear of becoming morally contaminated by these individuals. He says their friendship and love was given only conditionally to those who had made themselves clean and pure. But Jesus, but Jesus turned the dominant social, social pattern on its head. He freely ate with the moral and social outcasts. He welcomed and befriended the impure and called them to follow him. He did not fear that they would contaminate him. Rather, he expected, he expected that his wholesome love would infect and change them. And again and again, this is what happened. You see, Jesus is not confused about what he wants from us as his followers. He wants radical transformation. He wants our lives to be characterized by a deep longing for Him and His powerful, life-changing presence. And the Pharisees, man, they missed it. They could not comprehend this. You see, our hunger and our thirst for God finds its greatest satisfaction as we pursue Him through time in His Word, prayerful communication, and having faith in His promises. Pastor Lauren set this up for us over the last few weeks. God wants us to become more and more like Jesus. That's His desire for us. And by surrendering our will and by His Spirit, we are transformed. We can now become useful to Him to be change agents and change influencer, influencers just like Jesus. Just like Jesus. You want to know what it means to be like Jesus? Become a change agent, a change influencer. To be His witnesses. To make disciples, to advance his kingdom. That's what he's calling us to as believers. 
But there is a fifth essential that I want to add to my original four. A fifth essential I want to add. No human being should ever be devalued. We have value because of God. We have value because of God. We see this in 1 Timothy 2, 6, John 3, 16, Romans 10, and 2 Corinthians 5. I I challenge you, go back and look at these passages. 1 Timothy 2, 6, John 3, 16, Romans chapter 10. Yes, the whole chapter. 2 Corinthians 5. Sit with this and begin to understand the very heart of God through these passages. I want to read 1 Timothy 2, 5 through 6. I talked about verse 5 earlier. I just mentioned verse 6. I want to share those two verses with you. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 5 through 6. We're reading from the NLT. And man, if you don't have a Bible, we've got some on the back that you can grab today. We'd love for you to take that home with you because I'm going to be reading from the NLT and the direct copy is back there. 1 Timothy 2, 5 through 6. For there is only one God and one mediator who can reconcile God and humanity. The man Christ Jesus. He gave his life to purchase freedom for everyone. He gave his life to purchase freedom for everyone. This is the message God gave to the world at just the right time. And I will tell you folks, it is just the right time. And it is just the right time for us to be living this out. And to be spreading this message. There is only one God. There is only one way for us to approach Him. Through the man who was God in the flesh, Christ Jesus. This Jesus gave himself up to die on the cross as a ransom for the human race. For the human race. This act is a clear testimony offered at just the right time of God's desire to save all people. To save all people. Because all people have value. You and I and every other human being have value not because of our appearance, of our social status, intelligence, or wealth. It is because we are all created in the image of Almighty God. And He says, He says, we are worthy. Other people do not determine our value. Other people don't determine your value. God does. God cares how we treat each other because we are all created in His image. He makes no distinction between the inherent value of one race or ethnicity over the other. God is not about separation, but inclusion and unity. And Jesus, Jesus Christ, has made it possible for anyone to be included in the people and promises of God. I didn't say they all will. I said He has made it possible for them to be through His blood, through His sacrifice, through His redeeming work on the cross. We must come to faith and trust in Jesus. That's the way. And in view of all that God has accomplished for us in Jesus, how should we live? What does this mean for us as believers? How should we live? How should we be different? God has called us to be set apart, to be different from the world, to be holy as our Heavenly Father is holy. What does this mean? What does this look like? I'm so glad you asked. In view of all that God has accomplished for us in Jesus, I'm going to tell you how we should live. It's very simple. Don't conform to the pattern of this world. Don't be like the world. The world or age is distinguished from the age to come. While it is called this present evil age, whose God blinds the mind of, minds of unbelievers, yet it is possible for people living temporarily in, this, temporarily in this age to conduct themselves as heirs of the age to come. The age of renewal and resurrection. On them, the end of the ages has come for them because they are a new creation in Christ. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. It is by the power of the indwelling spirit, the pledge of their inheritance in the world to come, that they can resist the tendency to live according to the standards of this world. 
So if you have put your faith and trust in Jesus and you have received the power and presence of the Holy Spirit, don't tell me you can't live differently. I'm going to tell you you ain't tapping into the power source you got. You got all them tools from Home Depot or Lowe's in your little warehouse and you ain't using none of them. We need to start living like who we claim to be. I want to leave you today with a few thoughts to consider. These drive the way I seek to interact with people on a regular basis. And I just want you to consider them, wrestle with them a little bit today. The shade of color we are and our gender are both sacred. We did not have a say in the matter. Let me say that to you again. The shade of color we are and our gender are both sacred. We had no choice in the matter. God decided this for us. And we should never, we should never devalue another person regarding these two things. Second, we all are valuable because God says we are valuable. We are created in His image. We know who can unite us. His name is Jesus. He's the Savior for all. And maybe, just maybe, if we started acting more like what we profess, real change would take place in our world. You see, that's the heartbeat. That's the very heartbeat of spiritual formation. Because when we begin to see as Jesus sees, then we'll do as Jesus does. When we begin to see as Jesus sees, then we'll do as Jesus does. See, the gospel is for everyone, not just a select few. But do you believe? Has it changed you? Have you had a real encounter with Jesus? If not, are you ready to trust Him for the very first time today? You see, there's no better time to embrace the message of the gospel than right now. Jesus wants to solve your sin problem. He wants to solve your sin problem. Maybe you're here today, you've already trusted Him. Maybe you need to take a next step and follow through with baptism. Maybe you need to start serving or get plugged into a small group. Maybe you just need to, to pray with some, someone about some of the struggles and stresses you're having with all this mess that's going on in our world today. We've got ways for you to connect with someone online. You can also submit some requests and needs through our app. Man, if you haven't downloaded the Colonial app, I encourage you to do so. Fill out a connection card. Let us know what you're thinking, struggling with, what you need, and how we can help. And we'll follow up with you. Man, jump online in the prayer room chat and, and let somebody pray with you today. There's so many ways you can still interact in this, this season of social distancing. And we want to be there to help. At the very least, let's start putting into practice what we profess to believe. Let's pray. God, I thank you for this opportunity. I thank you for the work that you have done in my life. I thank you for the struggle that you have carried me through, for the experiences that I have had in my past that have helped to mold me and shape me into the person that you want me to be as I seek to become more like your son Christ. God, I'm not where I need to be. But praise you, I'm not where I used to be either. And I just ask that we will be about your work, spreading the gospel, sharing it with people who need to hear it, and we will be credible witnesses and examples, ambassadors for you, especially in this day and time. God, we love you. We thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you, Jordan. Ow. Guys, like rock hard. Hey, in all honesty, thank you, Jordan, for not just your friendship with me. Uh, yeah, thank him right now. Welcome back, buddy.
He really hasn't gone anywhere, but he hasn't been as visible the last few months. And I want to I reiterate one thing Jordan said. If anybody struggles with some anxiety, some depression issues, uh, we are the church where you can be yourselves. And when one of our pastors has the boldness to say that out loud and to go through a hard time and be real about it, I hope that's encouraging to you. Uh, and I hope you see his door is wide open as well as the rest of ours. Uh, I hope, I trust that you have heard the Lord speak today in some way. I don't know how he's spoken to you through a song, through the scripture, through something that Jordan said to us today. I, I, I know he has come through the cacophony of just overwhelming noise that can dominate us. I, I trust we have heard from him today, and I am grateful for one. I am very grateful. One week from today at the movies. You guys ready? We're going to do this. This is a big week. I want to encourage you, if you're online, learn how to stream that to your TV through our colonialchurch.com slash live site. That's the only way you can see it. Uh, let's spread the word. Let's pass out our link like it's a cupcake for free to everybody we know and love. Let's, let's in, invite a bunch of people that are maybe on the less cautious end of things that are, that are wanting to come here and be present physically. Two services, 930 at 11.15, grab a yard sign on your way out here or in front of the office during the week. Get yourself a t-shirt, represent around town. Let's make this a fantastic month here at Colonial where the gospel is going to be presented in some really creative ways. Does that sound good? Excellent. If you're online, thank you for joining us. We'll send you on your way. Have a great week.